Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you could take them and turn to the book of Isaiah, please. Isaiah chapter number 26. We are going through the book of Isaiah together as a church family. And this passage of scripture today is probably one of my favorite verses in all of the Old Testament. I know I say that about a lot of verses in the Bible. It's one of my favorites because there's a lot of good ones in there. Um, This would definitely be on the top 10 list. And the reason is this verse, well, the verse we're going to look at mostly this morning, focus most of our time on, has brought a lot of hope and help to me in my life personally over the different circumstances that I have faced throughout the course of my life. I memorized this verse when I was in high school. There was an event that took place, and it was a pretty tragic event that shook a lot of people in my life, a lot of my friends. And my youth pastor introduced me to this verse, first time I had ever heard it. And he said, this is a verse that you need to commit to memory, because there will be other things in your life like this that happen. One of my friends took his life is what happened. He committed suicide at 16 years old. And it just completely rocked my world. And I memorized this verse. And not only did God, through his word, help me get through that, but he's helped us get through a lot of other circumstances similar to those things in my life. And I'm thankful for those moments that he has brought us through those difficult hours. Isaiah 26, Phil already read the first four verses, but I'd like to go ahead and reread them with you this morning. The Bible says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. Right, That's the southern, the southern land of Israel where Jerusalem is. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation, which keepeth the truth, may enter in. Here's the verse that has meant a lot to me. Verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. If you don't have verse number three memorized, I would highly encourage you to underline that, highlight that, write it out on a three by five card or a post-it note. Memorize that verse this week because that is one of those rich scriptures that you will run back to many, many times during the course of your life. I think we all would agree this morning that the world in which we live today could hardly be described as peaceful. Um, There's conflict right now in certain parts of the world, right? Russia and Ukraine and all the things that are going on in Eastern Europe right now. What was boiling under the surface has now become a reality. Uh, Very soon, it could be Taiwan and and, and China, you know, fighting each other. A couple of summers ago, three or four summers ago, it seemed like the United States was uh, on fire, right? When all the inner cities, pretty much every inner city all across America, there was riots and there was looting and there was burning and it seemed like there was so much chaos and trouble. Politically, you look what's going on right now in Washington, D.C. Well, thankfully, we're on recess right now. But if you look at what's going on normally, right, in Washington, D.C., it's, it's just a mess. It's waiting to explode. We've seen over the past 10 to 15 years our country being taken, can I say this in a delicate way, further and further to the left, if that makes sense. Like we are moving away from the Bible and towards socialism and towards secular humanism than we probably have ever seen before. Um, I would argue that the, the two parties that are in Washington, D.C. right now, um, the, the divide that is there between them is probably stronger than it's ever been, maybe since the Civil War. In fact, I was reading an opinion piece a couple of weeks ago, and the author was making a claim that we are philosophically more divided as a nation than we ever have been in our history. Now, it should concern us today that right below the surface of these ideological differences in our country is potential conflict. I have a lot of concerns when I look at our country, and I'm sure you do as well. You see the abuses of the government, and you see the things that have even taken place this past week, and the overreach, and instead of it being a government of the people, by the people, for the people, we look at our country and we say very quickly those founding principles upon which our nation was was to be governed, they're very quickly being eroded away. Someone asked me recently, you know, Pastor, what do you think is going to happen in the fall, the elections? I'm not a prophet, right? So we're just having coffee and we're talking. He asked my opinion. And so I told him, I said, look, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I am very concerned, I told this person, about the geopolitical problems in the world today. 
and I think all of us would be, right? Putin and Russia, this empirical view of, of, of what he wants Mother Russia to be like, and, and then you have that funny looking guy in North Korea who wants to, to wipe out South Korea, and then you got the Iranians who are trying to get nukes, right? And, and they, and they want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, and even though Israel says they don't have nukes, we all know they do, and what are they going to do? If Iran shoots at them, they're going to shoot. And so there's a potential for a lot of major conflict going on in the world. So I told this person, I said, you know, when you look at the world, it doesn't look good for the future. And this person responded and said, that's exactly why I don't read the news or watch anything on TV. And I get the sentiment this person was saying. Like, I just, I kind of hide my head in the sand. You ever heard the phrase, ignorance is bliss before, right? That, that's kind of the idea where this guy was going with it. But for a Christian, can I say, that may not be the best thing to do. I know it's discouraging when you turn on the news and all you see is, you know, this and that, the world is falling apart. But for two reasons, I would encourage you to at least get online every once in a while and look at what's going on in our country. Number one, the Bible teaches that we are to be wise and to know the times in which we live. So that, that's part of being a good Christian steward, is to know what is going on in the world. And secondly, you as a Christian have something called a Christian worldview. You read the Bible, you study God's word, you've grown up around the Bible, some of you, you've gone to a Christian college, some of you have. You've been shaped and you've been molded and you know what the Bible says. And so when you face the news and you see the events that are going on in the world, you have the ability to take in the Bible and filter those events through the word of God. And so while it's comforting sometimes to just stick your head in the sand and pretend like nothing is wrong in the world, I, I don't think that that is the right attitude that the Christian should have. When it comes to evil, we ought to be simple towards it, Proverbs says, right? We ought not to know every aspect of the depravity of man, but it's wise to know what's going on in the world. And so when I look at the conflicts in the world and I see the issues that are going on internationally and then all the problems that are happening here in our country, I know that there can be fear in my heart. But when I see those things going on, when I have interruptions in my life, whatever it might be, that cause inner, tor inner turmoil and cause me to lose sleep at night, Ladies and gentlemen, can I just reiterate this point here today? When we go through difficult times, it is then that I have the opportunity to know and experience the divine peace of God. If there ever was a day and age in which we need to know peace, it is right now. That's why Isaiah said in verse number 3, our focus of the message this morning, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace who doesn't read or watch the news. Is that what it says? No, no. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Now, there is wide-ranging problems in the world today. Local problems to in our community to nationwide and international issues. And beloved, one of the reasons that you and I get stressed out about the situations that are going on in the world is because we feel like we can't control it. Wednesday evening in our Bible study, I made a statement, and I, and I want to reiterate it and repeat it this morning. Um, you might want to write it down, jot it down. It's not original to me, um, but I heard it somewhere along the line. Someone said, I cannot control my circumstances, but I can always control my response. I cannot control my circumstances, but I can always control my response. I can't control what someone does to me. I can't control if Iran decides they're going to launch a bunch of nukes at Israel. That, that's nothing to do with me, right? Let's say, for example, you're in a large group of people and you're at the parade and someone takes a car and it, you know, they, they ran through a bunch of people and you happen to be standing there. You can't control what someone does to you. But did you know that God in his word has given us a recipe that controls my response to those things that are outside of my control? And in a nutshell, the recipe is found there in verse 3. Read with me one more time. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Now, how does this verse apply to me some 2,700 years after Isaiah wrote it, he penned this, before the destruction of Israel? Now, if you remember, if you've been with us for a while going through the book of Isaiah, Isaiah was writing his letter, or he was prophesying as a preacher, to the, mostly the southern kingdom. That would have been the two tribes that stayed faithful to God the longest. The northern tribes 
They were the ones that rebelled against God and they turned their back towards God. During the day of Isaiah, there was a contemporary of him, another preacher that lived the same time, a preacher by the name of Amos. Maybe you've read through the New Old Testament prophet book of Amos, a short little book, just a few chapters. But he lived the exact same time that Isaiah did. Isaiah preached to the southern kingdom. Amos preached to the northern kingdom. And so they're preaching, if you don't turn back to God, judgment will come. I saw an advertisement uh, from a progressive church here in our community a few years ago. And the sign that was ad that advertised trying to get people to come to their church said this, we will not bore you with a history lesson. Now, I know going through the book of Isaiah, there is a lot of history and there is a lot of background, but you got to understand the Bible is filled with history. So what this church essentially is saying is we're not going to bore you with the Bible, right? Come to our church and we'll give you a little bit of, you know, feel good stuff and we'll give you some, some inspiration to take you home. We'll, we'll have you going home feeling nice about yourself, but we're not going to bore you with some of the history that we find in the Bible. There's a reason why God gave us every word in the Bible, in the prophecies especially. Because, well, there's one, one, of the, one of the many reasons is if we don't learn from history, we're going to make the same mistakes that the people of Israel made. And so, as I mentioned, there was a contemporary to Isaiah. His name was Amos. They, they preached the same time. Amos preached to the north, and Isaiah preached primarily to the south. In the northern kingdom, it was a very desirable place to live. If you've been to the nation of Israel, little plug, we're going to try to do that at the end of 2023. So the end of next year, we're going to try to take another trip to Israel. If you're interested, please let me know. But if you've been to Israel, you know that it is a, a country of stark contrasts. In the south, it's where the Dead Sea is, and it's dead for a reason. There is nothing growing. There's no vegetation. If there's anything, there's like small little scrubs that are growing up in the hills and the mountains. But it's arid, it's hot, it's like Arizona desert. And there's really nothing there of any value. You go to the north, that's where you want to be. In fact, if you go to Dan, the very northernmost part of Israel, it's almost tropical. The waters that are coming down from Mount Hermon, you have pomegranates and grapes, and you have all the almond trees, the orchards that are there. It's actually a very beautiful place to be in the north. And so if you could live anywhere in Israel, you wouldn't want to live in the southern kingdom. You would want to live in the northern kingdom. It would be equivalent to living, if I could say, in Loudoun County, right? A very desirable place to live. And yet the prophet Isaiah, I'm sorry, Amos, right, contemporary to Isaiah, he rose up to say to the people of God, in spite of your prosperity, God is going to rain down judgment. Now, the northern economy, the kingdom of the northern Israel was, was booming. It, it, was, it, was, it was like the stock market just kept going up and up and up, and there was no end in sight. All of the luxuries that were known to man 2,700 years ago, you can find it in the northern kingdom of Israel. And the prophets that God raised up during that time, they said, if you don't repent, there will come a nation from the north. We know that as Assyria. Assyria will come from the north and they will invade and they will completely wipe you out. They will take the northern kingdom captive. Now you think about that for a moment. What would it be like if I were to stand up before you today and say, hey, if we don't repent, in just a matter of a few short years, we're going to be invaded by Canada. Well, it wouldn't happen there. But we're going to be invaded by somebody, and they're going to wipe us out. They're going to destroy us. We as Americans cannot imagine what it would be like to have a foreign invader living in our land, can we? Now, many countries, Ukraine, places like that around the world, they know what it's like at this very moment. But we as Americans don't, don't know what it's like to be overrun by a foreign power and have everything that you own washed away and lose your retirement and lose your savings and the dollar goes down to worth absolutely nothing and we, we don't know what that's like. And yet, can I say that there is no guarantee that that will not happen to us? Isaiah's message, the message of the prophet Amos, very unpopular at that time, and they said, you as a nation have crossed the line and judgment was right around the corner. And Isaiah is saying this to the southern kingdom as well. In other words, Isaiah is preaching a message saying, you're enjoying all of these luxuries in life, but all of those things are going to come crashing down. And I wonder this morning, we as a nation, how long can we continue without all of this crashing down? If I were to tell you 10 years ago where we would be at today, you would have said back in 2012, there's no way we're going to go downhill that fast. 
I cannot, I read what is going on in the world today, and I just can't imagine the depravity of the human mind. And yet, what have we seen over the past 10, 15 years? We've seen a landslide in a direction that can only bring about the judgment of God. And so when we watch or we read the news, we have this unsettled feeling, or at least I do, that we've crossed the line and judgment is going to come in the near future. Okay, if that is the case, how do we live in peace with that? I find it very interesting in your Bible, going back to Isaiah chapter 26, that in this chapter, Isaiah has just got done proclaiming in the past 25 chapters the doom and the gloom and the destruction at any moment. And I find it very interesting that in spite of all of that doom and gloom prophecy, that God gives a promise in verse number 3. But like so many promises in the Bible, almost every promise, there are some that are non-conditional, but almost every promise in the Bible, there are two parts to it. There's the divine promise, and then there's the human responsibility. Very often in the Bible, God will make a promise, but there's a catch, there's a caveat. I have to do something about that in order to get that promise from God. There are some Christians who, you know, when facing a huge problem or difficulty in their life, I go to them and I say, well, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, you know, Pastor, we're just going to, we're just going to have to wait on God. Now, that sounds spiritual. I get that. I understand. I appreciate that. But I find in my life that most of the time when there is a difficulty or a problem in my life, I'm waiting on God, but at the same time I'm waiting on God, I need to be doing something, very, uh, something as well. The Bible is very clear. There's personal responsibility. In other words, we have to do our part, and then God does his part. I know this is a silly illustration, but let's say tomorrow your boss came to you and said you're fired. You say, okay, what am I going to do? I get collect unemployment for a little while, but eventually that's going to run out, and then I'm going to be in a whole lot of hot water. So we sit down, have a cup of coffee together, and I say, well, what are you going to do? You're obviously facing a mortgage payment, car payment, all these other things are piling on. You're going to have to do something. What are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to trust God. Well, are, are you putting resumes out? Are you going for interviews? Are you trying to find a job? No, I'm just waiting for God to bring that perfect job along to me. It doesn't work that way, right? We have a responsibility to go out and to work and to try to do our part while God promises that he will provide for us. So that being said, back to our text this morning. In this matter of inner peace, the absence of conflict inside of me. If I could define inner peace this morning, that's how I would define it. The absence of conflict, not outside, but the absence of conflict in my heart. How does that happen? Well, verse number three, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. The word th thou there, the personal pronoun, is referring to God. Only God can bring a settled calm in an absence of conflict. Genuine peace is not possible if you remove God from the equation. A few years ago, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal, and it was one of those opinion pieces as well, that, an op-ed that was written by a, a guest columnist. And the author of the article spoke about the greatness of America. And he traced our country and the greatness of our country to our Judeo-Christian faith, our belief in God. And essentially, the article can be summed up this way. The reason that we as a nation, the reason Americans are great and we are overcomers, is because in the past times of hardship, we have turned to God. My friend, there are far too many today who look for inner peace from places other than God. You Google it, inner peace, you'll find a thousand different websites. Look up podcasts on inner peace. Look up, you know, there's a thousand different things that you can find out their opinions on how to get peace inside of you. But can I say this morning, all of that apart from God is useless. You say, well, you don't understand. I, I need someone to help me get in touch with my inner self. Okay. Once you get in touch with your inner self, what are you going to do then? I, I'm being serious about that. Because if you see, um, being introspective is not a bad thing all of the time, right? There, there are times that we need to step back and we need to see who we are and try to see how other people see us. But if you see what God sees, that your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? If you get to the true inner core of who you are, when I look deeply enough... My inner self becomes a great burden and a great weight. What do I do when I realize that I am just a person who needs God? Well, the answer is simply you turn it over to the Lord. 
God's answer in his word is that you and I are sinners who desperately need a savior. And Jesus Christ came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that genuine healing only comes by being, the Bible phrase for it, is being born again and living a life of obedience to his word. Apart from being born again and obeying God, there really is no lasting peace. One of the more controversial ideas in the world today is this idea of forgiveness. It astounds me how many people, probably even in our church today, struggle with forgiving one another. You say, well, I know that I should forgive so-and-so for what they did to me. But if you know what they did to me, you would think twice about it. I'm justified by holding back and not offering complete forgiveness. No, you're not. The Bible is very clear. All of our sins crucified Jesus. And the only way that we can know peace if, is if there is conflict in my heart between me and another individual is to forgive them and to move on. That's the only way that it can happen. And when you come to the place where you can genuinely forgive the person for what they've done to you, that is when the peace of God floods your soul. When you can say, God, by your grace, I forgive someone. So this morning, the first thing I want you to notice in our text, real simple, in verse number three, there is no way that I can have peace apart from God. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. But like I told you, there's a second part to that promise, right? The caveat, what is it? Whose mind is stayed on thee. How do I know peace? Peace is not found by running to some new age philosophy. How do I know peace? Well, if you notice in verse number three, there are four ways I'm going to give you this morning to know peace. Number one, my responsibility is to consistently think rightly. Whose mind, it says in verse number three, is stayed on thee. I can read a very disturbing account about something that takes place in the news. And I can anchor my mind that God is on the throne and I can know peace. In fact, to me, when I see something happening in the world, and I see what's going on, and I read about an amazing story or a horrific story, remember I told you that as Christians we have the Bible and we can run everything through the filter of God's Word? Many times I'll hear something that's going on internationally, and I wonder in my mind, what is going on and how does that relate to what the Bible says is going to happen in the future? Is God moving towards fulfilling His Word? And so when my focus becomes on God, my thoughts are anchored on God, I begin to know perfect peace. But if I take God out of the equation and everything appears to be happening randomly in the world, and the biggest guns and the biggest triggers are possessed by madmen who rule the world, there's nothing more unsettling than that. But when I put God into the equation, you and I begin to understand that there is a sovereign God who watches over and protects my life, and God will not allow anything into my life unless he personally approves it. And as a result, when my mind is stayed on God, I have peace. So here's what happens. We get into a conflict, or we see things in the news that are unsettling, and we focus on the issue and not on God. Well, that's when the peace of God doesn't rule in your heart. And that's when you struggle to sleep at night. And that's when worry sets in. And, and that's when all of those fears plague your mind. And you say, but Pastor, those problems are so big. Yes, they are. But what I want you to see is when you're going through a problem in God, or in life, that, that you need to lift your eyes off of the problem and lift your eyes up to God, who is above the problem. And you see God sitting on his throne and who he really is. And guess what? When you look at your problem down here and you see God up there, you know what you're going to realize every single time? Our God is way bigger than our problems. And so when I'm going through difficulty in my life, if all I do is concentrate on the issues at hand and I forget about him, my friend, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is no reason to wake up in the morning. There is no purpose that you have in your life. But if in every circumstance my thinking, according to verse number three, is anchored in God and I am trusting in him, I look at the events of my life and I say, hmm, I wonder what God is doing, or I wonder what God will do. And I look at him in those circumstances in my life, and it is when I look to him 
that God gives me great peace. God does not make a promise to you that in your life there will be zero conflicts. I wish that were the case. I wish it were, you know, you come to faith in Christ and you become a Christian. You read your Bible and you pray and you go to church and God says, zero problems. It's going to be easy street. No, but what God does say is when you have problems, underneath those problems are the everlasting arms of our God. And when I understand that the conflicts and problems in my life, underneath are those everlasting arms of God, even when life seems unsettling, I can anchor my thoughts on God, and when I do that, I have peace with Him, knowing that He will hold me fast. Consistent focus on God means that I don't fear my circumstances, but rather in my life, I stand in awe of God, the God of the circumstances, who can turn those circumstances around whenever he wants to do so. And you know, I found in my life, like the Apostle Paul, he prayed three times that God would remove that thorn in the flesh. Perhaps you've studied that passage. Maybe in your life right now, you have a thorn in the flesh. Maybe it's one of your kids. Uh, my kids aren't here this morning, so I can say I have two thorns in the flesh, all right? But uh, maybe you have some thorns in the flesh and you pray, God, would you just remove this problem or take them away out of my life? Do something about it. I found in my life that God does that, not on my timetable, but on his timetable. So my responsibility to know great peace is no matter what is going on in my heart, to keep my mind consistently thinking right. Secondly, though, my responsibility, right? God says, I make a promise, perfect peace. Isaiah says, but you got to think right. And secondly, you have to trust right. What are you trusting in this morning? If I have a huge problem waiting for me at the office tomorrow when I go to work, am I trusting in my own ability to solve that problem or am I relying on God? You know, the danger of relying on your own strength to fix a problem in your life is we do what the Bible calls leaning on our own understanding. And that's not always the best thing to do. In fact, that's probably never a good thing to do. I must have a deep-seated trust that says, I trust God. And, and I know that after I've done the very best in a given situation, that God is going to take up the slack in my life, and he is going to work things out for his glory. You say, well, I ought to think right, and I ought to trust right, but who should I trust in? Great question. Isaiah goes on to further expand that in verse number four. Look at your text. Isaiah says, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah... There's that phrase again, if you've been with us the past few weeks, it's for in the Jehovah, Jehovah is everlasting strength. Whom should I trust in? God. Trust in the strength of the Lord. Now, it's really easy to trust in God when life is going good. And yesterday, the past couple of days have been so beautiful outside, right? 78 degrees, no humidity or really low humidity. Open up the doors, open up the windows, you hear the birds singing, and you just are able to enjoy God's creation. But when it's 95 degrees and the air conditioning breaks, it, it, it's kind of difficult, right? When you're sweating and you can't fall asleep because it's just such a miserable existence in your house, it's hard to trust in God. If we sit down and everything's going well in your life, and I say, how's your walk with God going? Everything's going great. I'm trusting in God. Okay, that's great. But when the difficult times come, that's when we have to trust the Lord. When it becomes real to us is when we have zapped all of our strength and we have to fully rely upon the Lord. Listen, trusting him means trusting in his strength, but it also means learning to trust his judgment. Look at verse number five in your text. Isaiah 26, verse number five. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high, the lofty city. He layeth it low, he layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread, upon it, tread it down, even the feet of the poor, and the steps of the needy. The Bible tells us there that the, the, the people of Israel were living in a sinful lifestyle, and God is going to eventually bring down a city from the north. And that city from the north during Isaiah's time, we don't know what it, what, who that was. Ultimately, it became Syria. We know that. The Bible doesn't say here. But God is going to destroy them because of their sin. Now, can I just say today, you and I look at the Department of Justice, or as some people say, the Department of Injustice, right? We look at what's going on in the world today, and we say it's not fair, 
you know, people who do wrong are, are let off the hook and people who do right are persecuted. And it's only going to get worse until Jesus comes, right? But you look at what's going on in the world and you say, I can't trust the justice system in America. Listen, you may not be able to, but you can trust in the justice system of God. And I know this morning I'm speaking to some people who are going through inner conflict because they feel like life is not fair. They compare themselves to other people and they say, God, why do you allow blessings in their life but not give those blessings to me? It's not fair. Growing up, it was the proverbial neighbor on the other side of the fence who had the greener grass, right? And you always looked across the lawn and you would look at their grass and you'd say, boy, I wish I had lawn, a lawn like that. Yeah, man, I wish I had the ability to, to take care of my garden like that person does. You know what the, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence looks like today? It's social media. It, hear me out, okay? I mean, this is my theory, not the Bible. But it's amazing to me how everyone on social media is trying to prove that their family is having more fun than everyone else's family. Some people, look, right, they look over the social media fence and they say, oh, they got to go on vacation again? Oh, they're doing this, they're doing that. It's not fair, right? And they're having a great time. God, it's not fair. My friend, the Bible teaches that justice ultimately will be done. And if you've been mistreated in the past or something is going on in your life right now in the present and it doesn't seem fair and you wonder why nothing happens to the perpetrator, can I give you a great reminder? Verses 5 and 6, God will dispense justice. It may not be now, it may be someday in the future, you may not live to see it, but be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So you trust in God's justice. But thirdly this morning, you need to trust, I'm sorry, number four this morning, you need to trust, uh, trust in God's timing. Look at verse number nine. It says this, With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. It's a reason why I encourage you to read your Bible before you go to work in the morning, before life gets going busy, because the day gets going and you forget about God sometimes. So the prophet said, with my spirit within me will I seek the early. The inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will not he not learn righteousness? In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord? Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see me. I'm sorry, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people, yea, the fire of thine enemy shall devour them. You say, I wish God would act immediately concerning the issues which cause me to lose sleep at night. My friend, God will act, but in the meantime, you have to trust. A lot of us in our minds, we say something like this. Maybe you've said this before. If I were God, I would deal with the problem right now. If you were God. Well, we can all be thankful today that you are not God, right? <laughs> because if you were God, we would make a whole lot of mistakes. God has a timetable upon which he operates. And part of that process is to acknowledge that God is working on his timetable. Think about the passage in front of us this morning. Isaiah has foretold to the nation of Judah that they're going to be destroyed in their entirety. Something so horrific. That we as Americans, we really have no idea what it means. We've never seen this before in our lifetime or in really the history of our country. He predicted deportation, bloodshed, death, poverty, economic ruin, famine, sickness, all the hurts and the harms of war. And yet he laid out that all of these things would take place in the timing of God. But look at verse 12. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou hast wrought all our works in us. God, you will give us peace because you are at work in our life. You realize the people that Isaiah was preaching to, Isaiah was standing on the corner, right? And he's being that street preacher that nobody liked, everybody ignored. And the people that he's preaching to are facing destruction that would forever change the course of their nation. An enemy that, that they hated would become the one that was their oppressor. How could these people, in spite of the imminent judgment of God, have peace? Now, here's what I find intriguing, and this brings it all the way back home with me this, or in, our, in our text this morning. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, 
Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Here's what I find intriguing. In verse number one, God says, in that day. Now, if you've been paying attention as we've gone through the book of Isaiah, I told you that the time, when you see the phrase, the day of the Lord, or in that day, Isaiah is saying, we're not talking about right now, we're talking about something that has not happened in the future. And every time we see that, it's talking about the second coming of Christ, when Jesus comes again. And so, in other words, what verse number one is saying is, there is coming a day, Israel, in the very far future, that God's ultimate plan for the universe for things to operate the way God wanted them to originally, will work out. Isaiah is predicting and he's preaching, Judah, it's time we trusted in God's control. Can I bring this home to us today in 2022? You say, well, what if everything blows up in the midterm elections? What if China wipes Taiwan off the face of the earth? What if Iran launches those nukes? What if North Korea invades South Korea? What if Putin takes over not only Ukraine, but he goes after Moldova and Poland and all the other former Soviet bloc countries? What if, what if, what if? Can I remind you of something? God is in control. How do I know that? Because in this passage, Isaiah gives us an outline of the events that will take place in his day. But he also says there is coming a day in the future when God is going to do something about the problems in this world. Look down at verse number 13. O Lord, our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us. That is a direct prophecy, by the way. After Judah and Israel were wiped out by Assyria and Babylon... Did you realize that Israel, the nation of Israel, has been controlled by outside powers ever since? They say, well, what about today? Israel is their own sovereign country. Yes, partly. In the 1967 war, there was a peace treaty between the Arabs and the, Pal the Palestinian Arabs and the Jewish people that actually gives the country of Jordan control over the Temple Mount and several areas in the ancient city of Jerusalem. And so, there are parts of Israel today that are still controlled by a, a foreign power. So in verse number 13, Isaiah makes a prophecy. He says, Lord our God, other lords, other outside powers besides thee have had dominion over us. But by thee only will we make mention of thy name. In verse number 13, did you realize that in Luke 21, Jesus spoke about this verse? Paul mentions it in Romans chapter 11 and verse number 25, that there would be a time period for most of Israel's history that, that she would be controlled by a foreign power. But, but there is coming a day in verse number 16, look what it says. Lord, in trouble they, the outside powers, the, the nations of the world, have visited us. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. And then it goes on to say, verse 17, like a woman with child that draweth near to the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so we have we been in thy sight, O Lord. Verse 16, if you have a study Bible, verses 16 and 17, it may make notice or note there that it's talking about the time period that we call the tribulation. The prophet has moved from the day and age in which they live at that moment, 2,700 years ago, to a day in the future in which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to allow great judgment upon the earth. You say, how do you know verses 16 and 17 refer to the, to the tribulation? Well, over and over again in the Bible, the idea of birth pains um, are mentioned when Israel is going through the tribulation. You can see Matthew chapter 24, verse number 18. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 3 mentions that. Also, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 30, verses 6 and 7, mentions the time of the great tribulation as if a time of going through travail and childbirth. And Isaiah uses the exact same picture here. So, there's coming a day in which judgment will come upon the earth and Israel like they've never seen before. But look at verse number 20. The Lord, is, the Lord says here, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as if it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. It sounds grim for Israel. They're to hide. Israel, their, their enemies are going to control them. They're going to overcome them. They're going to run. They're going to hide. Verse number 19 says, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. 
Verse number 19, it's to take time this morning, we, we can't go into it, but verse number um, 19 is a prophecy of not only the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but also that one day we too will rise from the dead. Somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, you know, cremation versus burial, what, what, what do we do? Well, the Bible doesn't give us implicit, clear direction, but throughout the course of history, human history, the people of God have always buried the body. They've always treated the body with great respect. It's just something that they've always done. And Isaiah says right here that there is coming a day where the body is going to resurrect from the grave. Now, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say you're right or wrong to do either one, right? Can, what happens if someone is thrown overboard and a shark eats them up? You know, is, are they going to be able to be resurrected in the last day? Yeah, absolutely. God's going to put together all those pieces. But this is a prophecy here in verse number 19 about how not only will Jesus Christ rise from the grave, but Isaiah says this, I as a, past, I as a prophet of God, 2,700 years ago, one day, they're going to throw this old corpse into a cave somewhere in Israel. They're going to put my, my pile of bones into, into one of those caves. And yet, even though my life is no longer in my body, there is coming a day in which the resurrection of the body will take place. What is the worst enemy that you and I can face? Well, the Bible tells us the last enemy is death. And Isaiah says, I'm going to die too, but there is coming a day of the resurrection. When is that going to happen? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse number 21. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her stain. Jesus returns at the second coming. When will this happen? Again, specifically, back to verse number one. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Why does verse 3 then say, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee? Why does it say that? The answer is because throughout the entire chapter of verse number 26... We have seen that God is in control of every aspect of human history. And that God has made promises to his people that though they're going to go through some very deep waters, one day the people of God will regather in the land. And that one day the Messiah would come again. And verse 19, every Old Testament saint would rise from the dust of the earth and they would enter, in verse number 2, they would enter into that glorious city. And you know what? I don't know what will happen between now and then, but I do know the end. All the details that take place between, between now and when Jesus comes again and sits on his throne in Jerusalem, I don't know what's going to go on tomorrow. I don't know what's going to go on in the next however long it takes for Christ to come back. But I do know this. I can trust in the God who mapped out my beginning all the way till I reach heaven. Why can I trust in him? Because he is not only my savior, but he is my Lord. And he will guide me safely home. So come what may, right? You could face the worst possible scenario when you walk out these doors today. Yet, no matter what you face in your life, perfect peace is mine. Because, verse number, tw verse number three, I can know perfect peace because my mind is stayed on What's going to happen? The elections this year? I don't know. But I can't control my circumstances anyway. But I do know this. Perfect peace is for those whose mind is anchored and whose heart trusts in God alone. Where are you at this morning? Is your heart anchored and trusting in God? Or are the storms of life enveloping you and devouring you so you have no peace in your heart? There is no joy in your life. My friend, if there is no joy, Satan is winning the battle because he has you discouraged and you're ineffective in serving the Lord. But if you can get a mind that has stayed on the Lord, realizing that he's sovereign in control of all the circumstances of your life, then you can put your head on your pillow at night knowing that as I do my best, God is going to ultimately work out my, my life for his glory. Let's pray.